Thank you for attending the introductory webinar, Gene Synthesis Application, Protein Engineering. My name is Jenna Rubnitz, and I will be moderating today's session. I am pleased to introduce our speaker, Dr. Akilia Watt, a member of the GeneWiz Project Management Team. Akilia earned her PhD in Molecular Biology from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, where her research focused on the development of molecular biology techniques for biological systems. During today's webinar, Akilia will provide an overview of approaches to protein engineering with a focus on gene synthesis. She will also review the gene synthesis process and share some basic advantages of applying a gene synthesis approach to protein engineering experiments. Finally, we will conclude with a question and answer session. You are welcome to submit questions anytime throughout the presentation by using the chat tool on the right side of your screen. Welcome, Akilia. Good afternoon. And to those of you joining us on the West Coast today, good morning. The topics discussed today will include an overview of protein engineering and will highlight two commonly used approaches, a rational design and directed evolution. Next, I will introduce a gene synthesis-based approach to your protein engineering pipeline and share a brief overview of the gene synthesis process before moving into a few advantages to consider and conclude with a question and answer section. Before we delve into the talk, let's take a minute to define protein engineering. In its simplest terms, protein engineering can be described as the thoughtful manipulation of proteins to confer desired properties or other changes within a particular protein of interest. In most cases, protein engineering is commonly used for three purposes. First, to create a superior protein with enhanced enzymatic functions. Second, to produce a larger quantity of a specific protein. And third, to produce an advanced biological compound, such as a storage protein or synthetic drugs. There are two commonly used methods in a protein engineering pipeline, as mentioned a minute or two ago, a rational design and directed evolution. Let's begin with a rational design. In this process, one relies heavily on the knowledge of the protein structure and function, and can be summarized by these four basic steps, mutagenesis, protein expression, purification and basic QC steps, and finally, biochemical testing. Now, I know this slide is particularly busy, but let's move through it together. Within this process, mutagenesis is critical as it generates the mutants for downstream applications. Hence, the mutagenesis step must be successful, otherwise the entire process would fail. Taking a closer look, the generation of mutants can be further divided into three steps, beginning with mutagenesis, followed by screening and selection, and finally DNA amplification. The mutagenesis step alone is composed of a number of intermediate steps, which really begins to highlight the complexity of this process. Preparation for the mutagenesis step also requires some time and thought as to a painstaking oligo-design approach as well as setting up numerous PCR reactions. Subcloning is also oftentimes considered and completed. This step creates a clone consisting of a section of the gene of interest that corresponds to the desired protein region of interest that requires further manipulation. This now serves as a template for the mutagenesis step, and it substantially reduces the risk of incorporating unwanted mutations if a larger region of interest was used in the PCR reaction. Once the PCR step has been completed, 
You insert screened to, to, to select for desired traits and then completely sequence to ensure that unwanted changes have not been incorporated during the PCR step. Next, the subclone is recloned to recreate the full length protein of interest, following which the chosen clone or clones are amplified and then downstream reactions can begin. Now let's switch gears a bit and talk about the second commonly used method within a protein engineering pipeline, directed evolution. Unlike the rational approach, in directed evolution, one does not necessarily have to rely on, on the prior knowledge of a protein structure and function. Again, the general steps are summarized here. First, random mutagenesis. Second, protein expression. Third, purification, selection, screening, basic QC, and finally, biochemical testing. Now, I know what you're thinking. Here we go again with the flowcharts but let's move through it one section at a time. Again, once we take a closer look at this process, we soon realize that it is not as simple as it was initially presented, and rather resembles a similarly complex flowchart previously seen in the rational approach. Similar to the rational design, the generation of suitable mutants is the critical step here that can also be further divided into three parts, beginning with mutagenesis, followed by screening and selection, and finally DNA amplification. Unlike the rational approach, for the directed evolution approach, saturation mutagenesis is applied. Given this approach, a substantial number of mutants can be created. Of course, depending on the type of mutagen used and its success rate, approximately 10 to the 8th to 10 to the 10th mutants or even greater mutant numbers can be generated. A few examples of mutagens commonly used are chemical reagents, fragmentation or DNA sharing type approaches, or setting up PCR reactions with degenerate oligos, just to name a few. Now, given the vast numbers of mutants that are generated, successive rounds of tedious screening and selection is required to effectively enrich for a smaller population of mutants for further study. Once a mutant or mutants have been suitably identified, Again, they are completely sequence verified to confirm that the phenotype seen is as a result of the change or changes within the intended protein of interest. Now, although the two commonly used approaches for protein engineering is oftentimes represented by such simplified diagrams as shown here, the actual processing more accurately resembles this intricate and complex flowchart when we expand on only the first step in this process, which is the generation of suitable mutants. However, the process of protein engineering can be further streamlined by the application of gene synthesis at this stage. So what exactly is gene synthesis? Again, let's take a moment to define the process. Gene synthesis can be defined as the de novo synthesis of any DNA sequence of any length and can be placed in any vector backbone. This technology allows for the easy manipulation of nucleic acid sequences that correlates to the intended protein of interest. Gene synthesis effectively creates changes within any specific region of a protein and also allows for the studying of the effect of a one, one change or a combination of changes with regards to a specific protein region of interest. Here, the key word is regulated, or better yet, controlled. As one can see, this sets up a nicely streamlined system to rapidly test new and existing hypotheses 
related to protein structure and function. Let's look at the gene synthesis process in more detail. The process is really composed of four straightforward steps. Beginning with the first step, in conjunction with the project scope and analysis of the protein of interest, one derives at the nucleic acid sequence corresponding to the protein of interest, and hence, a strategy has been designed. Next comes the oligosynthesis phase, which is nowadays done at a rapid pace and generates the building blocks of the synthetic gene. Following the oligogeneration stage, individual oligos are assembled and amplified to create intermediate fragments. And as the process continues, eventually the full-length synthetic gene is created and is cloned into a suitable vector. Once the clone has been generated, QC testing, such as restriction enzyme digestion, as well as sequencing, is done to ensure that the synthetic gene is identical to the starting reference sequence as per the project design. This clone now correlates to the generation of a nucleic acid construct that consists of all the desired properties or changes one wishes to confer on the specific protein of interest. Simple, right? Now you ask yourself, why should one consider adding gene synthesis to a protein engineering pipeline? Here are a few advantages to consider. First, sequence complexity. Using the example shown here, gene synthesis can be used to create genes with these types of repeats. Another example of complexity commonly seen is GC richness. Again, the target gene can be generated by a gene synthesis approach. And yet again, even with combination type sequences that more commonly reflect naturally occurring proteins, their generation can also be accomplished via a gene synthesis approach with relative ease. Another example of an advantage is the creation of relatively limitless construct sizes. As shown here, even constructs up to 50 kilobases can be created these days. Again, application of QC methods previously mentioned, as shown here in the image to the right, restriction digestion analysis, can be used to effectively confirm successful construct generation. High throughput capability is also an advantage. Now let's say that one wishes to change or wishes to study the, change, the combination of changes of a desired protein region of interest. In thinking ahead, you would like to generate these isoforms at the same time for either subsequent testing or side-by-side -side analysis. In this aspect, one can exploit the process of gene synthesis based on sequence similarity to create these isoforms. As shown in the diagram here, an alignment of the original or parent protein with the desired isoforms allows for easy pinpointing of regions most suitable for designing specific oligos to rapidly create all of the different variants seen here based on the parent sequence as a template. Codon optimization is also a great advantage. Given that the codon usage tables are available for a number of different expression systems, and since the synthetic gene is created based on a nucleotide reference sequence, it is quite easy to shift the codon distribution of the synthetic gene to make it more suitable for expression in a particular system. Let's use the example shown here of the arginine amino acid. There are six different codons that can code for this one amino acid. A quick comparison of the codon distribution between humans and E. coli shows conflicting codon preference. That is, 
codons most frequently used in a human system are actually those most rarely used in an E. coli system. This disparity can be easily fixed by applying codon optimization such that the codon usage can be manipulated to better suit the intended expression system, thereby facilitating better protein expression. Finally, using a gene synthesis-themed approach to your protein engineering work allows for the generation of creating novel fusion proteins. Here, strategically tagged proteins suitable for the use in localization tests can be created, examples of which include using GFP tags as well as other visual tags. Here, one can use these tags to visualize proteins moving from one place to another within a cell or a system and create really neat time-lapse videos. Additionally, one can create fusion proteins more amenable to purification approaches, which makes sense, right? What's the point in creating a novel protein if you can't purify it and work with it? As in this example, commonly used tags, commonly used tags such as HIS or GFP are often applied since there exists great protocols for effective purification and downstream uses. So to summarize, protein engineering via a gene synthesis approach allows for, one, a simplified approach to your project design, two, regulated or better yet, controlled manipulation of targeted regions of interest within your proteins, third, high throughput capability which is essential in generating a number of different isoforms or variants for further testing. And fourth, one can easily generate single, double, triple, and any foreseeable combination of mutants to further study. All of this really leads to a platform that is most suitable for testing and rapidly testing, actually, existing and new hypotheses relevant to protein engineering studies. So in other words, using, a gene synthesis, using gene synthesis sorry, as part of your protein engineering process takes you from a workflow that looks like this, where each step represented here can actually be represented by a separate and convoluted series of additional flowcharts, to a workflow that looks like this. Given the details I have shared, I hope that I have convinced you of the capability and potential of using gene synthesis as part of your protein engineering pipeline. So with that, I'd like to conclude this section of the webinar and open the floor to entertaining some questions. Thank you for your time and attention. Thanks, Helium. We'll now begin our question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question, please type it into the chat box on the right side of your screen. Our first question is, how frequently does codon optimization work, and how often does it produce the desired result? Great question. Unfortunately, there is no real concrete answer for this, and that is because it really depends on the protein of interest, as well as the system in which you're expressing this protein, since there are other regulatory mechanisms and other pathways to consider. Nonetheless, we have received data from a few of our clients indicating that the synthetic genes that we have delivered that have been codon optimized using our algorithms have been shown to work well and have actually demonstrated elevated protein expression. The next question is project related, and it is, I'm working with a novel model system that is not listed as one of your choices. How can I get my sequence optimized? Great question. As long as the code on optimization table is available, we can certainly facilitate your request. 
Now, in the event that a codon optimization table has not yet been made available, we can certainly work alongside the client to further accommodate your request. So our next question comes from right here in New Jersey. And the question is, what is your opinion on codon C optimization? Excellent question. Recently, we have received a number of requests from a few clients uh, to perform codon D optimization, since it's a new way in which one can reduce protein expression levels as opposed to a typical knockout study. Um, at this time, our algorithm does not directly offer this function. However, we can certainly work with our clients to manually change specific codons to better suit the project scope and thereby facilitating codon de-optimization as it applies to the intended project. Next, we actually have another question related to protein expression. Have you heard of codon harmonization? And if so, what do you think about it? Excellent question. There has been more and more data surfacing about codon harmonization in the sense that um, a lot of scientists now believe that harmonization actually facilitates better protein folding and overall better expression. Now, since the data at this time is a bit inconclusive, it's hard to actually say if this process is actually necessary, if it's tissue-specific, organ-specific, or even species-specific. Nonetheless, if a request is made, we can certainly work alongside the client, again, as mentioned before, to further tweak the reference sequence for the synthetic gene to suit the project scope. Our next question comes in from California, and this question is, if our genes have 75% GC content, can you guarantee synthesis? Great question. Now, although the gene may consist of 75% GC content, we would really need to take a closer look at the sequence since we want to know how distributed is the GC content across the entire reference sequence, as well as we need to consider factors such as are there direct repeats within this region, does it consist of um, an inverted repeat, and basically, what is the overall distribution of this complexity? With that being said, although the gene might be branded as being a bit complex, it does not mean that the gene synthesis will actually fail. And we have a lot of novel strategies and techniques in place that we can apply to these types of projects, these types of projects to actually, um, you know, to make it more successful. Cecilia, our next question is, it deals with protein tagging, and it is, what options do I have if I want to add a tag to an existing protein, and do I have to resynthesize the entire nucleic acid counterpart? Another good question. Um, and we do understand that in most cases, although it might seem redundant, we might actually need to resynthesize the protein region that you currently have. However, before we can actually make such a judgment call or determination, we really need to look at the overall project scope, take a look at what materials are available, and then suggest our best recommendation to assist you in tagging your protein of interest. Our next question is, will a codon optimized sequence affect protein folding or protein structure? Good question. Although this is unlikely, it is definitely a possibility. Nonetheless, we have received some data from our clients indicating that the proteins that they have expressed from their synthetic genes that have been codon optimized do not function apparently, nor do they function
what happened. was asked, will um, an optimized sequence affect protein folding and protein capture? So in short, although it is likely, it is not necessarily completely, um, it, it's not necessarily an event that will happen. Um, with that being said, we have recovered data from our clients indicating that the proteins that they have expressed from uh, synthetic genes that we have created do function well. In addition, they have not provided us with any kind of indication or data to suggest that the proteins are non-functional or function in a way that is contrary to the predicted function or the untapped protein. I've got a question about variant libraries and codons. Can you do variants? Okay. Thanks, Akilia. Our next question also comes from California, and this question is, if we are trying to create a library of variants of a protein where we are trying to change all the codon possibilities for 100 amino acids, can you guarantee synthesis of such a library? Great question. Here at GeneWiz, we do have a number of um, techniques at our availability. And we also do consider and accept projects such as the one described on a regular basis. In order to move things along and to further assist you, we would require that you provide us with a copy of the starting reference sequence as well as additional details, and we can further work with you to create such a library um, to better suit your downstream application. Our next question is, what type of limitations does gene synthesis present for protein engineering experiments? Well, that's a funny question. Relatively none. Although in some cases, as mentioned earlier, um, due to the complexity of the gene of interest, it might take a little finagling, but in most cases, we do provide the final delivery. And this is actually going to be our last question of the day. The question is, what methods can be used to synthesize unstable or toxic genes that generate toxic proteins? Great question. A number of our clients are actually quite concerned by this possibility. Now, as mentioned earlier, although these types of projects might be a bit challenging, Given our experience and the advancements in gene synthesis, as well as the availability of other um, approaches, these projects have been becoming more and more successful these, these days. A few recommendations to consider would be using a low copy or a single copy vector that might make the construct more stable. Additionally, one can use other chemically modified uh, vectors, such as um, stable 3 or sure 2 cells, for example, and to then apply things like lowering temperature and modifying media in an attempt to make the final deliverable stable. So it really depends on a case-by-case -case basis because any one or a combination of these uh, factors might actually prove to be beneficial and substantial for a particular construct. Thanks, Akilia. And thank you, everyone, for attending Gene Synthesis Applications, Protein Engineering. Please feel free to contact us anytime with questions or for more information at 908-222-0711 or by emailing us at enews at genelives.com.